Um, welcome, everyone. And um, I'm really happy uh, to see so many people in here because when they assigned us this small room, I was thinking, well, we only have one or two people. Will anybody show up? Um, so, um, yes, yeah, thank you, everybody, for your interest in this topic. Um, so, uh, we, um, that is um, Kristen, and also online, we've got Elisabetta, and we also have Moshgan, who cannot come today, um, have set up this workshop to basically tell us, uh, tell you a bit about women in HPC, and in particular, also um, the workshops that um, we've been running. Or, I mean, I, I've only been involved over the past two years or so, though, but there are others who've been involved much longer um, at various um, high performance computing conferences and um, various initiatives that we've made and that we, we had. And um, the people, the speakers, um, will tell you a bit more about what it is like to be a volunteer. Um, that's what Kristen will talk about. And we've got Alison here, who's a co-founder of uh, Women in HPC, and will talk a bit about how it was created and why it was created. And we also have um, Ellen here, who supported us um, as an ally at um, various things, at um, setting up of a, an ACIR chapter, for example, and also um, generally um, supports women in HPC. And then we hope to have a discussion and uh, we hope to um, have you ask questions and have a discussion about, okay, can these learnings be transferred to other spaces? What might be specific to high performance computing? I think there's very few things that um, cannot be actually applied to another space. And so, and um, yeah, basically um, anything that you're interested in and anything why you actually came to this room or joined the online room. Um, so, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got the self view deactivated here. That's why I don't see myself here. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so um, I think we'll start straight away um, with uh, Kristen's talk, that is, and just have to find the right thing here. And oh. how many workshops? Um, hmm? Sometimes workshops are just three. Like right. depending on our audience, they might have three or something like that. We don't feel like being involved. So. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hide your face. Hi, everybody. Okay, tell me, am I in the right spot for? Okay, cool. Hi. Um, so, hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Merritt. I am CMO at Alsa's Flight, and I'm here to talk to you about my journey into volunteering and how to take the next step in community involvement. I always like to start with a little bit of fun facts about me. I always tell people I am proud to be a technically non-technical person. My background is humanities and classics. Um, and um, my original career was actually grassroots fundraising. So I have a background in working with and recruiting for volunteers. And in fact, that is translated into my current volunteer role with Women in HPC as uh, one of the fundraisers to try to bring money in so that we can do really cool things like we will be in a few weeks of sending to women who otherwise could not attend the International Supercomputing Conference to Hamburg, Germany to present their posters to the world. Um, I fell into tech by what I call happen circumstance. I started out in enterprise tech, uh, then went to finance and have spent the past six years working in high performance computing. But that's about me. What am I here to talk about today? Well, when Marion invited me, so thank you, Marion, to come and speak about my volunteer journey, I realized you couldn't really talk about volunteering without addressing community and what community is and what it means to many people. There is, in fact, three definitions for community. So you've got your people sharing common interests or beliefs. You've got your people sharing kind of like an ownership. They're living together all the way to the ecological side of so people who are sharing the resources or conditions. And when I looked at that, I realized that there are three words that sort of popped out at me that talked about kind of the journey from being a part of a community to being an active volunteer. It's got interests, ownership, and conditions. 
in general, now I'm not saying this is always 100% true, you will join a community because you are interested in something, be it from a small level or maybe it's something that's been a passion of your whole life, really wanted to be a part of this. And as people usually get gain more interest in a community, they sometimes feel comp compelled to take on ownership, right? And the ownership in general, I would like to say we're all uh, for the benefit of the greater good is to improve the conditions that you're in, right? So theoretically, we're all volunteers just by being in this room, right? Theoretically, from a really high level. And I realized that by stepping into this room, you are putting yourself forward. In fact, I almost wanted to say there's like a three stages towards that eventual volunteering role. Um, the first of which is showing up. And um, we were discussing this in um, our little breakout earlier about you need to bring your whole self, not half of yourself. You know, they always say you can't half-ass anything. You have to bring your whole ass with you. And those are the kind of things that we talk about in terms of, of coming into this room. The, the sign that's there, that's been floating around the internet for quite some time about bringing your own energy in your space and checking yourself before you enter in. Because if you come in in a bad mood, there's a very good chance that that bad mood may actually impact someone else. Whereas if you come in neutral, open, you know, they talk about body language, standing open, ready to receive, then you're more willing to be an engaged part of your community. And that can lead to phase two, which is the willingness to exchange knowledge and to have conversations. This particular conference from like point one, I work in high performance computing, it has a tendency to not be very inclusive. In fact, they actively for a long time put up a lot of barriers and we're slowly taking them down. Um, they, the exchange of information, the willingness to speak to one another, that's like going your next level in volunteering terms. You're coming into um, being more of a part and taking on the ownership, which is that quote unquote unpaid role of being part of that community with the willingness to improve that community. So that's my little kind of segue into my experience as part of Women in HPC. Um, ta -da. So I joined Women in HPC, I've been in for six years, going on seven, five years ago, uh, where I was asked if I wouldn't mind doing the social media, and I've done it ever since, and since I've taken more roles within Women in HPC. So that's the website and QR code if um, anybody's wanting to snap. It is free to join Women in HPC. We don't, we don't do any charging. And when you join Women in HPC, you can have the opportunity to become a part of a particular group. Now you can do this from a volunteer perspective or you can start at the community level. And by the way, membership is open to anyone, not just women. In fact, we are active about allies as Alan will speak to later on today. So what are the volunteer opportunities that we provide? And in, while I'm talking about what Women in HPC does in terms of volunteering, you can also think about the other communities that you're part of. Maybe some of this up here, you go, ooh, is that part of this particular community or that particular community? And like the chapter and affiliate level, um, the N8, which Marion referred to, the chapters and affiliates were our savior during the pandemic, that local level stuff. So if you wanna get involved more on the ground, or you want to find out more on the ground, this is where you start. And here's the best part. Some of these groups have a really active online community. So if you maybe want to know, I, like the Australian New Zealand chapter has the most active Slack known to mankind. Mm -hmm. um, you can like <laughs> chat all day and all night with those guys. They, they are always up and talking. Um, you can do that. Uh, the executive committee. So started out social media, moved up to fundraising, not a big deal. If you have experience at those kind of levels, like maybe overseeing large scale projects, there's gonna be some roles opening up there. Um, but I think one of the ways people don't realize they could contribute to our group or even the group you're in is through uh, the communication side. We've had plenty of guest blogs. We've had plenty of people say, I've written something for my institution and we cross post. We also find out about events and things that are relevant to our membership. Happy to post those. Same thing with jobs. So those are ways you can get involved. Well, you know, that's a, a way to get involved without getting like, oh, getting in deep and, and holding on the mantle of I am volunteer leader of X. 
Um, and then we've got the major conferences. So ISC and SC, I've been a volunteer for both. I actually am the social media for SC. So if anybody does SC conference series and you don't like the social media posts, it's my fault. Um, <laughs> so I write them. Uh, but the, the main thing is, is that there are large scale events too. And we work very, very hard on bringing those in. Um, ISC is gonna have a poster reception. Uh, we managed to get space for early career women to do a talk at the exhibitor forum um, and a networking. And SC is like ISC on steroids, like times five, it's huge. The workshops all day, huge diversity day, huge networking reception. So there's always ways to get involved. And then we can go back to the mentoring side of things. So education, right? Exchange the ideas. This was, uh, I've taken this on occasionally, other people do too. We mentor a lot of early career women. We do it for the conferences, but we um, used to, and hopefully now that the pandemic may be receding continuously, would like to bring it back up to global level. And that can be anywhere from people just talking about one little thing and they have their three months and they flit off um, to some people like I've been lucky to build a few really long-term relationships with some of my mentees. So, these are options that are out there. And the funny part is, is when Marion said, talk about your journey, it's like, nah. <laughs> there's my journey. I've done a little bit of everything and I don't mind it. And I'm lucky enough to work for a company that actually sees the value in it and they want me out there and they consider it part of my job, which I know some people sit there and go, oh, I cannot put that on my KPIs. I can't put that on my list. I can't put that on the check. I'm lucky enough that they actually say, well, this is part of your job. This is part of what you should do, because even though they are a commercial institution, they understand the necessity of bringing back to the community exchange of ideas, and they value that. And I very much hope that um, people in this room have the same experience, or if not, please talk to me. We're hiring. Um, <laughs> but with that, um, I just want to say in some that everyone here has a part to play. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Marion, for inviting me. Um, you are all active volunteers within this community just by showing up and bringing your, yourself and your presence into this room today. Thank you so much for that. And that if you want to do more, uh, a place like Women in HPC is open to you and we welcome you and thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we'll do uh, questions later, but feel free to already put them in the Slido that I showed earlier. I'll, uh, you know what, I'll quickly show that link again, or that QR code for those of you who weren't there earlier. So if you want to ask any questions, uh, please um, put them in there and we will come to it um, later. Okay, um, so we've now heard um, from Kristen about, okay, what, what all the volunteering opportunities are and um, what you can do and um, what we are doing in Women HPC. So um, Alison will now talk a bit about um, how it actually um, came to um, establishing women in HPC and what the idea is. And um, Alison, are you able to share your screen or do you want me to share my screen? I'm going to do my best. So can you see that? I've just got to go into presenter view if I can get rid of a bit at the top. Yeah, I think that looks fine. Okay, so can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so as, as Marion said, um, I'm one of the original women in HPC. Um, so Marion asked me to talk a little bit about where we've come from, where we're going to, and how far along that, that, that journey um, we are. So women in HPC started around 10 years ago. So at the time I was working at EPCC, EPCC had additional money which had come in from hosting the EPSEC National Services. So it was really the first time that we had a mandate to send um, a larger number of people to the big international conferences to talk about what we were doing. 
So that was the first year that there really were a number of women. So I've been going to the conferences for a while. I dare say I was used to the fact that they were very male dominated. Um, but, a, you know, a couple of the younger women, one of them being Tony Collis, went along and they were really shocked. You know, when you look, if you look at these pictures, wall to wall men, everybody who, who won any kind of an award was a man. Um, and the question really was, why are there not more women working in HPC? Because we were all very passionate about what we did. Um, we were very committed to our careers. So we thought, what can we do about that? And the first step really was to investigate the reasons for that. So we put in a workshop proposal, which was initially rejected because it wasn't a technical proposal, but we managed to persuade supercomputing that it would be a good thing to do. And we've never really looked back from the workshops from then. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we have achieved, what we've set out to do, and what we haven't set out to do. And then that's maybe something we can discuss um, later on. So, so the first objective really was to bring together women from different countries with different roles in HPC together at large international conferences, because it's very easy if you are the only one working in your institution or your area, uh, not to have other similar people that you can discuss your ideas with. More generally, it was to raise awareness of the challenges of being a woman in HPC, so women didn't feel alone, and to offer support to women and to their organizations who were trying to make changes. Um, perhaps most importantly, it's provided opportunities for networking, for friendship, and for sharing experiences. So certainly from my point of view, I really look forward to going to the conferences now because you see people that you've made friends with, that you can, you can share stories with, um, that you can discuss issues that are important to you. And I think when you're going into a very big conference, which perhaps has 12,000 people, it's nice to feel that you're grounded with a number of other people. We've done a lot of work on educating the community on the importance of diversity. Um, and why we have to grow that so that HPC um, can grow in itself. And more recently, setting up chapters in lots of different areas of the country or in countries, which have allowed regional groups to set their own priorities while sharing experiences from other, from other groups. So what's women in HPC not done or not set out to do? Um, so more recently, there's been some discussions about whether um, we should be merging with other organizations. There's a lot more organizations um, representing women in data, AI, ACMW, um, for example. So does it make sense to have a group which is really looking at women in HPC? And up till now, we've come to the conclusion there's still a lot of work to be done in the HPC space. So we're going to continue there. Um, again, what we haven't done is formally join with other organizations which are looking after other minorities in tech or in wider society. So, so a lot of this discussion um, was, was sparked off by things like the Black Lives Matter movement in the States, um, where clearly um, on thinking about it, you know, here, here's women in HPC. It's a group of largely white, well-educated women who are already quite privileged. Was it right for us to have a, a group where we were talking about the challenges we were facing or should we be um, more interdisciplinary? And again, we decided that we, for the moment, we were better being allies with other groups, but uh, representing women in HPC. And the other thing we haven't done is we haven't become a politically active campaigning group in the UK. So, for example, there was no coordinated women in HPC response to the future of compute review, although I know that some chapters and a lot of organizations did comment on equality and diversity issues um, in that. So that these are things we've not done that possibly we could be looking at doing in future. Um, and I thought I would finish, um, this is the most up-to-date information I could find out about um, the number of women working in tech. So we don't have up-to-date information on HPC, but as I say, these are a bit more general and it's probably fairly typical of HPC. 
So 26% of the workforce is women, um, which is better than it was a few years ago, but we still have some way to go um, to increase that number. Um, gender pay gap, 16% compared to a UK average of 11%, uh, but that's largely because um, there are more women graduates coming into the tech industry, and these women are still in more junior positions. So what we have to do is ensure that women coming in have the right opportunities and the right support so that they can continue to advance in their careers. Um, so flexible working and appropriate language has gone, which are, are things that women in HPC has campaigned for, have gone some way to attracting and retaining women. But I, I personally think we have to think about the long-term effect on career advancement for women. If there are more people, more women working remotely, there has been some research there that that might be a challenge. And does it matter that women are concentrated in certain areas of HPC? For example, there's very few women working in systems administration. There's far more working as RSEs or in project management positions. So should we just be pleased that there are more women in HPC or is it important to have a mix of women across all the different parts of the sector? Um, and finally, um, we know that there's a demand for far more women in tech role models. That's something that comes out of all these government reports and reports in universities. But this does put responsibility for increasing diversity onto women themselves. You know, if you're not out there acting as a role model, how are other women going to think that they could be like you? And somehow this perhaps um, divests organizations and society in general um, of doing more about it. So in terms of do I, th so just to, to summarize, um, do I think we've made progress? Yes, I think we've made a lot of progress. I think we need to discuss next exactly where we're trying to go because we can't do absolutely everything. So what should be the priorities perhaps for the next five or 10 years for organizations like Women in HPC and for the HPC industry and community as a whole? Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. And I think uh, we could have the whole discussion about the questions that you brought up. Um, but we have one more talk. Um, Ellen um, will talk about being an ally. And I hope if you start to speak, you will come up. As yeah, do I come up as a... Or do I is that good? Come? You can pin probably if you want to. The problem is when I do it on my computer, <sighs> it doesn't change what's on the big screen for some reason. Ah. <laughs> can somebody have a look on that um, laptop there where they, you can pin Ellen? It's fine. I'm, I'm in the interest of time. I'm happy to just start and then we figure it out. Actually, I, I think that um, the AV is always broken in these ally talks of mine, and actually it's it's made it better. Um, because my slides failed in the first one and, and I managed to say a whole load of things that I, I don't ever put in slides. So um, I think really um, my, my main take home to all the other people that are in their career get identified as an ally uh, in this is the first rule of ally talks is um, if you're ever asked to do an ally talk, you should never refuse. Um, and so there was a. I was invited to SC twenty two to do a um, a talk at the at the Women HPC workshop, and then I I did one in the US as well um, at the Coalition for Academic Scientific Computing a few um, a few months ago. Um, so hopefully this is just something that I'll share my kind of story and will um, and it might prompt some discussion. Um, so who am I? I'm a director of advanced research computing at. Durham University. Uh, I was parachuted in there about five years ago to set up a dedicated uh, research computing unit. And prior to that, I'd spent, I kind of worked my way up from kind of a user support position uh, to kind of a similar sort of position in at Leeds University. I've done system administration. And before all that, I did a biomolecular simulation PhD. And I tell you all this because literally when I did that transition from 
kind of into management and I had to then start form a team. Um, I was adamant that the only people that could kind of do a job like well, literally that the job that I did was literally me, like literally had my my experience and I was totally, um, you know, I was totally unprepared for management in that way. And and actually I made particular hires which which didn't look like me over the over the period over like initially, you know, and they really blew me away with with what they brought to the table. And it completely revolutionized my entire thinking about, you know, that I had this kind of hallelujah moment about, you know, um, about actually going in completely opposite direction and, and actually I you know not really hiring anyone that is just has that base experience and really celebrate the diversity um in 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 a, in a kind of in a, in, a, in a team and and so I think really in Durham we've been really I've been really blessed about I somehow managed to establish a really a quite a diverse research computer um support team um and and I kind of you know, it, it, it does take a lot, right? And um and it takes everybody is 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 really you know, I, I'm a I'm the director, I can set a tone, right? But I think that it is something that everybody, you know, lives and breathes, um, the sort of commitment um to um an inclusive environment. And and that involves, you know, you can never getting complacent you know always keep you know constantly challenging the practices that are kind of become convention um you know and it's not about listening to you know people will tell you things but about how you're doing or whatever but what are you not hearing you know who's not turning up to things and can you can you kind of you know who's not engaging with your particular unit and can you actually come up with some strategies to kind of fix those things um, I think one of the the really great things has been seen. I mean, and the Women in HBC chapter has been a, a wonderful thing, and Marion's involvement in that's been fantastic. Where, you know, people have managed. You know, there's an environment where people have been able to step forward and kind of there to kind of catch, but just letting them just completely uh, lead and own that kind of um, that kind of area. Um, you know, but you know, I think. You know, there's 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 so many things. You got. I think that HPC you have this kind of dichotomy sometimes, where um, on the one hand it's really it's really you know it's it's I would say it's kind of elitist on the one side, and you know very macho in in some ways because it's a very macho image. But yet, actually, you're trying to you know enhance research in in a, in a really diverse sense, right? And actually reaching out to new disciplines and making it accessible to new disciplines and things like it's you know it there it there is constantly this how do we make these things that are kind of the forefront you know really accessible at that particular level um and there's various things we've done along the ways um i think one of the great outputs that that's being produced is under under an eight is is this kind of edi checklist where just looking through when we're doing recruitments you know, checking off whether things are actually necessary um, in terms of, you know, why does this role need to be full time? Um, why aren't we offering flexible? Is there a really good reason behind these things? Are we are we being, you know, are we? In, it's, it's changed the way in which we've actually been doing doing recruitments. Um, also, at the end of all the recruitments, we we tend to have a mop up session where everybody's kind of opinion is heard about, you know, who turned up, who didn't. Um, we've we've put it. We, we've we've done things around um, trying to uh, put in place female-led technical training, um, and one of the great things that I think that's that's been possible through the Women HBC initiatives is, you know, really being able to showcase role models, um, you know, um, and and showcase some of the novel and non-traditional use. Um, there has been real challenges, um, and I think that. We've had some very challenging, you know, um, exchanges. I mean, I remember in one of the job interviews, there's there had been, you know, Durham had hit the headlines because of um, a, a particular kind of diversity related uh, incident, and you know, it was it was really refreshing as part of the job interview process that the that the candidate actually asked us about this and how you know what really our position was as a department. 
when it when it comes to um, these things. They, some of these some of these things are really challenging, right? Um, and I think you know what we are you know we're what we're doing at the moment is looking at what really the candidates trying to ask of our, our departments, not just what we're trying to ask of the candidate. We're trying to produce a little bit of data around around some of these things. But what's the vision, right, around around this? And I think that what we're as a department we're trying to do is move beyond the metrics and and kind of make inclusivity um, core to our kind of departmental mission. And that is, as probably some people who are here will use a testament, is actually easier and said than done, right? Um, you know, in in some ways. Um, you could some people I guess it could be EDI is one of those things that's seen as a kind of implementation detail um but I, but I think that you know we need to turn this around within um, a particular area where it actually becomes front and center because research computing is one of those things that should inherit be inherently in, in, inclusive um so as as a kind of ally it's always a work in practice um, and it will always be a work in progress and and that's really you know, um, what I've got to say from my life, our life perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just to pick up on uh, one thing that Alan just said in terms of role models, Kristen had done uh, has done an amazing job <laughs> over March um, to collect more than 40 profiles of women in HPC and put up a um, continuous blog post working weekends and evenings, I don't know what, to, <laughs> to um, actually have the selection of um, yeah, 40 women in HPC um, on the supercomputing blog. So or where do you find it? Do you know uh, from the... I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll put it in the notes. Um, we did it for the supercomputing conference series and they let me do it. Well, actually I just did it. And who, who is it? who is it who said, don't ask permission, just do it? That was that was how I handled it. <laughs> I was like, I'm doing this now, and um, the community actually really. I, I actually went out to the women in HPC community and I said, Would you who, do, nominate some people for me? And I had 65 people get nominated, and 41 of them accepted and published. So, in terms of things, anybody who works in uh, communications and marketing, you're usually looking at 20 to 30 percent. That's the level of commitment that our community has to showing people, shining lights on people. So I'm very proud of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, I will have a look at the Slido um, and see. I see so far just um, one question. So please put in more questions um, if you have them. Um, I'll have to see what happens. Ah, I'll share. Maybe I need to share my screen so that you can see or see it. So, um, the question thought for Alan, happy to go to anyone that change and perspective when forming teams is crucial. Congrats on being able to change to create spaces that welcome everyone. How do we help others realize this? What made you see the light? So, um, Ellen, do you want? So, to I, I got asked a very similar question. Um, that I, which was um, a, a while ago, which was actually um, more about. Uh, I think that the the opportunity that I had. I mean, I, I was in a very unique position where I had a blank canvas in Durham. Okay, and from the outset, you can kind of set a tone. And I was I was asked another question, which was, you know, had you been in your old job in Leeds, right? Um, how might you know? Would it would it would you've done the same thing? Would you may have ended up in the same position? And I think that the you know your I think that I was I was really blessed with a really good opportunity in Durham, where I was able to kind of realize that that was going to be a tone. I, I know that within um, in other positions you, where you've got to create a, a cultural shift um, and you're kind of doing it through, I mean, you, you kind of got to do it through example and then shine a light on it, example, shine a light on it, example, shine a light on it. And, and, and I think that it can be much tougher 
and there can be a whole load of other battles that are going on at the same time, which makes things makes it that EDI tends to kind of sometimes ends up, you know, filtering to the bottom. Um, so I think it's awareness and being able to pull it back up to the top and making it, you know, so that it's not just, you know, it just becomes intrinsic in 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 in, in what's going on. Um, I'm happy for other people to reflect as well, but I was look. I think I've been lucky, right? Thank you. Um, is there anyone of the other speakers who would like to add to that? I was going to say, I, I think more generally, there's a move towards diverse teams, whether that means, um, you know, data scientists working with RSEs, working with sysadmins or whatever. So, so I, I think already having this view that everything in HPC is less siloed than it used to be makes people a bit more open um, to incorporating people into teams that perhaps they wouldn't normally have worked with. Um, plus, I think if we're honest, the difficulties in recruiting people um, nowadays for academic and, and research organization salaries means that we have to be creative. You know, we have to be more welcoming. Um, we have to be more inclusive. So I think there's a number of things coming together um, which are, are resulting in better outcomes. And maybe following up um, for that, um, before I go to the next question, Alison, um, so um, have you actually seen a change in attitude towards the WOM HPC workshops or what's happening at the um, conferences? So has the audience changed um, that turns up or has the atmosphere changed um, in what's happening? Yeah, I, I think there has been a change. Um, Part of it is, of course, that the organizers of these conferences have realized um, that women want to come to these workshops. And if they if they allow and encourage events like that, um, they'll increase the percentage of women, they'll increase the overall numbers. So from their point of view, I think there are some altruistic considerations, but there are also some monetary ones. Um, the audience has changed from being largely I mean, it, there's still perhaps maybe 60% of the audience is women. That, so the audience has changed from being overwhelmingly women to being a slight, a slight majority of women. I think there's far more people who come along because they're interested in learning and contributing, either because they're from other minorities or underrepresented groups, or because they're genuinely interested in learning. So to me, I think that that's an indication that people see women in HPC as having a pioneering, outgoing um, role at these conferences. So, so I'm very encouraged by that because obviously at the beginning we thought, well, we'll run out of things to say at workshops. You know, how will we ever keep it going for more than a couple of years? Um, but it is still going from strength to strength. Um, Kristen, do you want to add something to that? Thank you, Alison. Um, one of the things that was discussed in the breakout group that we had um, just earlier for CW was um, the use for um, open discussions on recruiting as a tool to bringing uh, kind of like opening the door to discussions on diversity inclusion is really um, has been a real breakthrough, I think, in the HPC community and in the tech community as a whole. Um, I was lucky enough to give a presentation here in Manchester um, at a very local community left uh, HPC conference which Miriam was part of, where I realized that if I got up and kind of attacked the audience, that would be a crazy idea. I mean, because you could, you could come up and be like, you know, everything we're doing is wrong and we should be doing better. And instead what I did was I went through all my notes on ideas that people had put up on um, opening the door to inclusivity as well as resources. And that actually opened up people feeling comfortable and safe and having more discussion around um, you know, what it means to be an ally or what it means to feel like you're the only, um, you know, the only gay guy in the room or whatever it is that, that people feel. Um, and creating that kind of space where you kind of put it in a, you know, you want to recruit these people, we need to have these tough discussions. Um, and creating space for that, I think, has been a real breakthrough in hopefully making it so the world's, a, uh, you know, the world of HPC and the world of tech is a bit more of a welcoming place. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions on here as well. 
um, uh, I'll read them out. Um, hopefully you can access it um, so I don't have to share and unshare all the time. Um, so um, that is to um, Alan's um, uh, statement about um, that you don't reach certain people and um, that you look at who's not in the room. And the question is, have you had any success reaching the people who aren't in the room? And I think, um, Alan, you could um, answer that or also um, anyone else who has an answer to that. Um, I, I remember Kristen coming to one of our, um, I think it was one of our, it was a launch of our department actually. And um, I do remember that because obviously, you know, brought into to can deliver HPC and we, we kind of, you know, made the first iteration of that particular um, event for launching our department, you know, was, you know, let's get everyone who kind of traditionally is seen as doing great HPC in Durham at this event. Okay. And we, you know, we, we ended up basically with this list of these, you know, CDM male figures, um, like you kind of, and we sort of looked at it and thought, I, I'm not even sure that, you know, that is, is that going to be a really engaging event, you know, that are we just going to get the normal people, you know, the usual people kind of turning up. Um, and so we, we turned that event completely on its head. Um, and, you know, we had um, all sorts of people telling us their aspirations um, around, um, around HPC and, 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 and research computing. Um, you know, we had classicists, we had, you know, I, we, Kristen kind of remembers it, I think probably probably better than me, but we had we had we had all sorts of people and we had a real diverse engagement um, with with the university and it was it's kind of set the tone for the for the entire kind of future, I think. Thank you. Um, yeah, Kristen. That was the best event ever, just so you guys know. Um, active choice. It was an active choice, I think. That, that what Alan did there, and that's something you guys can take away too, is made a choice with the group that we're not just going to have maths and chemistry and physics come speak. They had digital humanitarians. They had, it was a library, a person who did digital libraries. And the first thing she said is because you can't get people to visualize a library when you're looking online and like the difficulties of that. And that like blew the doors open for why some people can't embrace certain types of technology because you can't see it. And so it was so good. And I felt like I belonged for the very first time and that, that I wasn't just like, hi, I'm intruding in the room. So I just wanted to say that was, that was a really good event and it was a conscious choice. And I think that that kind of thing makes a difference with how you can shift a culture. Thank you. I'll move on to the next question because we actually have um, quite a few coming in now. So um, one of the main antagonists in the EDI story is unconscious bias, which is largely an evolutionary reflex. How do we tackle this head on after the point of recruitment uh, of recruiting someone? So it says also happy to expand on this thought. So if you want to expand, I can hand you the mic or. Yeah, so um, I guess this is to, to Alan and, and Alison. Um, you know, you, you've got teams of people. So you recruit people, you attract people, it's fine. You've got all your recruitment. You know, the wording is great. You know, you've got women applying and, and, and they're hired. How do, you, how do you make them feel included in the team, right? How do you get over the development of in-groups and, and, and all this kind of, uh, you know, these effects that, you know, just kind of exacerbate the feeling of imposter syndrome and that kind of thing? You know, because there, there are a lot of situations where I've seen women have been recruited and then they leave or they're recruited and then they assume a particular type of role within the team that's not necessarily, you know, as prestigious technically, you know, as some other people. So it's, you know, you still end up with that male domination, even though you've got a team with women in it. So what are the structures that you put in place to kind of get around that? Sorry that I'm talking too much. Um, do you want me to start? I think the, the first thing to say is it is a real problem and it's not easy. Um, so I think awareness has to be the first defense against it, but there are a number of other things um, that I've seen working at, for example, at the Hartree Center. Um, so things like, instead of having a culture where people will go after work to the pub 
um, to get together for their groups. So that's not that discriminates really against um, anybody who doesn't drink, anybody who's got to drive home, um, anybody who's got to be back um, for children and other caring responsibilities and to try and, and have events where people can get together, which are a bit more inclusive. Um, thinking carefully when you're putting people in, in teams or getting them to work together, perhaps to mix them around a bit more, um, recognizing who needs a bit of additional support and perhaps giving them a mentor or somebody um, of a similar background or somebody who you know is sympathetic to work with them. And I think a lot of it's about, about talking to people and listening to them and trying to create an environment where people you know, are prepared to come forward um, and present their ideas rather than whoever's in charge assuming that they know all the answers. Um, so again, in STFC, um, some reverse mentoring um, has been going on, and that's the kind of thing where perhaps you've got somebody from a different background who's speaking to somebody senior and, and giving their viewpoint on, on how things could be better. Um, but it's, it's, it's always going to be an ongoing process. Thank you. Anyone else wants to add to that? I was just going to remark that one of the things that I found really uh, really refreshing is, is not something that I've kind of instilled, but something that I've observed the team doing. Um, and I think this, you know, it, it is the sort of the human beingness um, and, the, and the quality of human beings like that, that are actually in, in our unit that I do see a lot of people um, you know, within the within the team, supporting other people, like literally just you know going for ad hoc coffees or or whatever, and reaching out and having that, creating a kind of a natural kind of supporting network between 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 them. Um, you know, I, I think that that's been really really good, and it's and it's happened almost you know um, just because of the people that we've had have wanted to really. Put, put those support networks in place. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, to what extent do you think the community culture has changed in terms of people seeing those with different shapes of experiences as equals? Don't know who wants to take that one. Okay, uh, I'll repeat it. Um, to what extent do you think the community culture has changed in terms of people seeing those with different shapes of experiences as equals? Yes, Kristen. Um, let's talk about positives of the pandemic. Um, I think that when we were all forced into a place where we all had to see each other's houses and each other's lives and realized how things kind of was were overlapping i firmly believe that kind of helped shift community narrative in terms of um people not feeling like they had to have two different personalities their work personality and their home personality they could bring both to the to the table um i think the other thing i is that tech has shifted pretty dramatically in these past six years at least in high performance computing um, we had cloud now we have ai um, and then we have our standard on premises we have people moving hardware off premises but still managing it and so it's almost like people are diversifying how they use technology so why should we be put pigeonholing people into certain places and certain types of jobs and roles and i think that's helped kind of jar something loose that otherwise maybe would have put people in the, oh, you're in high performance computing, you should be hugging your servers and putting them to bed at night. And it's kind of gone from that to, yo, you're in high performance computing. So what, where, where do you specialize? And I think the topic and discussion has gotten broader. Um, so it's a bit of a, of a mixture of, of things that I can see from a really high level that has helped open the door to bringing better inclusion into the community. Thank you. Yeah, Alison. Wrong spot, guys. <laughs> Alison, did you want to answer that question? Um, I have a personal opinion. Um, so, so this is so my view is um, that 
if you're an early if you're in the early stages of your career i think the situation is okay i think if you're senior i think the situation is okay i think you know i think that people will regard you as an equal um, at these stages in your career where i think perhaps um, there's more tension is with people in mid-career um, where, where you get more competition, you get people who, who are more concerned with, with sort of justifying their position and the choices they've made. So that may be a bit controversial, um, but I think it's at that stage, um, you know, that, that we need to be very clear about um, you know, making sure that people don't feel you have to follow a particular career path which frankly doesn't really exist in HPC, um, that we can get back to the stage where we're, we're valuing people um, for, for their characteristics and their contributions and not for particular achievements or um, you know, being male, female, gay, um, a lead researcher in, in X, Y, and Z. Thank you. Yeah, 10 minutes left, yes. <laughs> Okay, I'll um, go through it. So I have four more questions here. I think we can do them all, um, but I might just um, ask one of you to answer them unless somebody burningly wants to. Um, so um, the next question here is, um, how can people help to fix the gender pay gap? Is it just a case of waiting for more women to get into more senior positions? Noting that it is illegal to pay someone less based on their gender, are there additional causes for the pay gap that aren't just an imbalance in seniority? Who is able to answer that? <laughs> Difficult question. I think if there are imbalances, it's more likely to be because the roles where, which are predominantly done by women are less highly regarded by the people who set the pay bands than some of the ones that are dominated by men. So I think we, we have to be quite clear that we don't want to go down the same route as, as things like medicine, whereas the number of women have grown, um, it tends to be men who have the more consultants jobs or, or more jobs in, in areas like, you know, as surgeons or the like, and more women who work in family medicine. So I, I, th I think it's, uh, as employers, we have to make sure that uh, when jobs are graded, that th there's equal pay for similar work, regardless of, of which sections of the, of the HPC community take these jobs. Thank you. Um, the next question um, is for Kristen. Um, from the more than 40 women in HPC you profiled, did you see much diversity in career paths and diversity in terms of other characteristics? Everyone admitted that they, most people, almost everybody said they didn't mean to get into this career. <laughs> we didn't start out this way. Um, I, 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 I did a summary where I kind of really said the first thing that I noticed and it made me not feel so alone is that um, there's sometimes this, there's a bias within um, high performance computing sometimes if you don't say, and I have an engineering degree in, or I have a physics degree in, or I have a chemistry degree, that they suddenly don't value your work as much because you didn't, I guess, suffer enough. I guess we had to suffer more. Um, however, I'm like, I've been in marketing and tech. Let me tell you, um, I, I, I was, what was it? We were discussing at the, at the breakout session where I said, when I came into tech, there were still women in bikinis giving out shots at conferences. Okay. So I think I'm good, <laughs> but um, that was the biggest, the biggest thing I took away away from me the second biggest thing that I took away from that um, is the fact that every time I asked for someone could you give me uh, someone to reference um, I at least had two two references from each person I interviewed I could have spent a year profiling women easily a year um, just doing women in high performance computing and I was stunned and I had to talk you know we always talk about the imposter sy syndrome that I'm not HPC enough uh, because I'm not a system admin or I don't put in, you know, I don't run networking on cables. That's apparently that's what you're supposed to be in room in HPC. But that's not it. We've got software developers. We have RSEs. We have people like myself who go out and um, talk more of the broad picture and the strategy of high performance computing. We've got people working on new technology. Um, and I think, I think the thing is, is like, 
understanding at the end that people came into this field, that they've made it their own, and that they're willing to go out and promote other people, that's a great sign. And we should always champion and be happy about that. Yes, and definitely there was, was a big diversity and career path in um, that blog series. Um, regarding flexible working and work from home is something that particularly benefits parents and women. Has COVID going online more flexible working helped show how flexible work can be? If yes, has this continued to be so, so now? Uh, to be so now we are back to more face to face. Ellen, maybe do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I think that um, I, I think I think that we, you know, in this sector particularly, you know, it has to offer. You know, I mean, these jobs can be very. A lot of them can be very flexible, um, unless you're you physically need to go in and you know lug tin around. You know, I think that a lot of the you know, a lot of what we be doing in terms of um, you know in terms of the software engineering team. Um, side of things within our, you know, is, you know, it's, it's all, it's all flexible working, right? Um, you know, because it, it, there's no choice, right? Really, because the, the, you know, people can go and do their, you know, are, are well set up in their homes after COVID, right? Uh, to do some of these things. I know, I know, there's a whole load of people who who like to be in the office and enjoy, you know, a, a lot of that. And I think, you know, it, it, it's it's bringing the kind of opportunities for people to come together. To do things, um, you know that, that that that's important, you know, and a lot of that can be done online. And there's a whole lot of other things where you want to, you know, just create the space where people are together and not necessarily in the work context. So we're, you know, we're, we we tend to get together within our department on like volunteering days um, rather than kind of just kind of like Thursdays our day in the office kind of things. Um, I don't I think anyone's really got a set day um, unless they've made it their own routine. Thank you. Zay is, nicking and, uh, is, is nodding in the background. <laughs> She's also on our team. Um, last question for Alison. What would you consider the main achievements of women in HPC and aligned groups and efforts so far? And what would you hope for most going forward? What would you hope for most going forward? I think going, going I'll start with, with looking forward. So going forward, we want to have an environment where um, HPC is a career that's open to anybody. That you know, it's not. It doesn't have this view, this um, perception of being terribly difficult and only open to geeks. And I, I think we've begun to break that down. I think you know some of the work on on role models and and showing that people who work in HPC are just like a, an ordinary cross section of the community has helped that. So in, in terms of the main achievement, I think it's it's providing a focal point for discussion where we can also compare what's being done in the HPC space with what's being done in, in some other um, industries or um, subsections of, of, of the tech community. Um, so so I think we're I think you know although we're 10 years in, I suspect we've still got a good few years to go. Um, so my hope is that you know we'll, we'll reach a stage where the women who are coming in now don't face the same barriers or the same questions as they progress in their careers, um, and everything's much more straightforward and smooth for them. Um, but I, I still think there's going to be challenges ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so two minutes left in our session, and I just want to say thank you very much to Alison and to Ellen and to Kristen for your talks. Thank you for trying to answer all these quite difficult questions. And um, yeah, I I realize that we've not talked so much about like, okay, what what? Oh, yeah, I get sign that I have to move over here. Sorry, um, that not so much about, okay, what can we now do in X profession or in Y field or so, um, but I hope um, that maybe there are some ideas that you got and maybe just some impressions and please feel free to talk to Kristen or to me um, when you see us around and also on Slack and so, and 
Uh, I've put uh, the link to Women HPC on the um, document. Um, you can also let me know if you want to join the Slack workspace. So there's an international Slack workspace, which is open to everyone. And yeah, I hope uh, this was interesting for you and that you got something out of it. Thank you very much for coming.